Good afternoon. Uh, as everyone should know, our, the theme of our conference today is trust. And I was thinking this morning about how venture capital is kind of a trust business, right? Uh, you have LPs that give their money to Sequoia, trusting that they're going to get better returns than just investing in the stock market. And then you give your, your funds and invest it into founders, trusting they're just not going to light it on fire. Um, <laughs> and of course, the founders, you have to trust that, the, that your venture partner is going to be there for you uh, and the many times you need it. Uh, Luciana, I want to start with you. You have uh, a really fascinating storied career in software. Uh, and then it was almost two years ago that you made your first bet uh, and into Robco as a hardware company. I'm sure it wasn't the first hardware company you looked at. What was it that was so compelling? What made you make the jump into hardware at that time? Well, firstly, thank you so much, Mark, for having us here today. It's a pleasure to see you and, uh, and the lovely audience and to be here with one of my favorite startups in Europe and globally, which is Robco. Uh, and I really like your framing of venture capital being a business of trust because at the end of the day, it's a people business. And when we look at companies, especially because we invest so early oftentimes, it's really about choosing the right team. And this is the same in software companies and in hardware companies. But to take a step back, as Sequoia, we have been investing in hardware companies for quite some time. We were fortunate enough to partner with Apple five decades ago um, and SpaceX many years ago. Um, but I will say, I had already been investing for about a decade when, when I decided to, make, to, to sponsor a first hardware investment. And really, it was meeting Roman and his co-founders and, and hearing the vision. Building hardware companies is really, really hard. Uh, building any, you know, the, the odds are against you in software businesses as well. I think that's even more so the case in hardware. Um, and, you know, I always say that it's 10 times harder and you need a 10x team. And what do I mean by that? I, I'm a big believer in the fact that in robotics, you need a combination of deep love and understanding of robotics, but also operational efficiency and a commercial DNA. And I think finding that combination within a team is actually really, really rare. And that was the big unlock for me when I heard the vision from Roman. He met his co-founders at, um, at uh, the Technical University in Munich in the AI and Robotics Department. It's one of the best in the world. They are clearly you know, big, big lovers of, of robotics and AI, but they clearly want to solve real customer problems and are incredibly focused on delivering value, operations at scale, which is no easy feat. It might not sound, sound as exciting as, as AI, but it's equally important. And yeah, it was really seeing those ingredients come together in Roman as a founder um, that yeah, convinced me to, to partner with them a couple of years ago. Have you done any since in hardware? Um, maybe, um, you know, we, we look at businesses, um, we look at businesses in, across all sectors, yeah. Got it. Uh, and so that deal was if December of, of 2022, which is in tech, you know, decades ago, I guess. Uh, Roman, I'm curious, that was a, a month after the launch of ChatGPT. What's changed for you since in the past two years? Like, what would you, what would you say the, the major change from, from that, from the time that Sequoia invested? Yeah, so to your comment of, uh, you know, two years feeling like a decade ago, we always jokingly say at Robco, Every startup year is like a dog's year, so you count it by seven. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, you know, that's just an internal gag. Um, no, I think, look, we've moved um, from stage one in robotics to stage two and now stage three, mm -hmm. but much, much faster. And what I mean by that is, in the past, you've had pre-programmed machines going from A to B, weighing you know, 500 kilos to be set up by an expert in a matter of months um, at a price tag of millions and more. Yeah. And then that stage two happened perhaps 30 or 40 years after the initial robots were deployed, which was a lightweight robot system, delightful to use, think of an iPad-like experience, which we spearheaded when founding Robco in 2020. And now stage three happened only four years after that, right? So 40 years from one to two, four years from two to three. And that third stage, and which is also what we think the future of robotics is gonna look like, is much, much more autonomous. And so one example to make this really concrete is one of our favorite clients, um, big, big upsell client as well, I dare to say, and they manufacture hearing aid products. So all of us who have to use perhaps hearing aid products, who have, you know, grandma, grandfather who has to use them, um, there's a massive um, supply constraint, which is mainly driven by the supply chain and by manufacturing. And so by using a dedicated, autonomy-driven, modular robot solution, like we offer it, you can bump up that productivity, 
get supply out there by automating through the night, through the weekend, to ultimately provide those hearing aids to you know, our loved ones. And so I think there's many of those examples that are driven more and more in a future that's much more autonomous and much more robotics driven. And we want to, of course, design and spearhead that future at Robco out of Munich, but you know, for Europe and for the Western world. So uh, you have the actual robot sort of on their assembly line? How many, can you, can you share that number? Yeah, so maybe just a step back. So our vision is to solve labor shortage with robotics, yep. right? And so labor shortage is most prominent at those simple, repetitive, tedious manufacturing tasks. And so what that looks like to your question, Mark, yep. could be on a CNC machine, could be on a laser machine, could be for a pelletizing, depelletizing application. And we set up software, hardware, and the full holistic integration to perform those tasks, but in an automated fashion. So what previously was done in a 5 a.m. morning shift, right, in a loud environment, we now do with a delightful modular smart solution that we offer at Robco, and that's the way we go about yeah. more than 250 customers. Do you consider yourself an AI company? This is, it's a leading question here. but Yeah, leading question. <laughs> so we founded Robco out of the chair of um, robotics and AI, okay, pre-chat GPT. So the core of our technology is a digital twin, digital twin software technology that controls and steers those hardware devices. And so I think we fall right in the, in the middle of you know, being very much AI driven. Well, I'll turn the audience for our participation here. We have this, this really fascinating stat that just came out from CB Insights. Um, this is a multiple choice question, so uh, you, you can only be right or wrong. Uh, but what percentage do we imagine in the audience that, that during the, I think it was Q3, uh, the global venture funding went to AI startups? Uh, we can take the, a, a little bit too. And then I think what, what we talked about, oh wow, jumps, let me just the first bit. Um, this live feed. Should we guess as well? Uh, you can guess, <laughs> yeah, but I think, didn't I tell you the answer backstage though? So. <laughs> but I, think, like, it, I feel like one of the, it, which we didn't really interrogate this is, is you know, part of the issue, uh, Luciana, is how do, you, how do you define what, what an AI company is? And, I, and I'm sure now every single pitch you receive is we're an AI company. And I'm, I'm curious how Sequoia defines it and then can you share about what percentage of your portfolio is sort of is it AI right now? I would have given you my original guess, okay. just so you know, yeah, please, which, which would have been uh, the wrong one. <laughs> ah, the original <laughs> because guess you is, did tell me. is 45. Um, I, I would have, yeah, exactly. I would have guessed um, a higher percentage than what you're going to share with the audience. Um, we are, listen, AI is an incredibly important technological trend, probably the trend of our generation. Yeah. So of course, we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what are go going to be the large platform companies coming out of, the, of this trend that are going to thrive and compound for a really long period of time. For us, um, in the last 12 months, it's about 60% of our investments in, in companies that think of themselves as AI native. Um, it's, as you say, it's, it's maybe it's difficult to, to define very clearly. I would say if a company didn't have a right to exist before large language models, mm. Um, that's how we think about an AI native business. Um, or I guess if the product is just so much better thanks to large language models and the, the experience, the customer experience is so much more delightful and, and really completely differentiated, I would say those are AI companies. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's an area where we're spending a lot of time. So the correct answer for the audience is, is 31%. So it's about a third, which is I think higher, or kind of, I don't know if it was a record high, uh, interesting, though, this audience guessed, guessed 45%. Uh, it would have been my guess as well, for yeah, what it's worth. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm in line with the audience. Maybe that's a definitional issue. Um, uh, Roman, you're, you're in Munich, uh, and, which is a fascinating startup scene. Uh, Germany is in the midst of... Uh, I'm, you primarily work, tell me if I'm wrong, but with small and medium enterprise, and that's sort of the focus. Um, Germany, like many countries, is, is trying to, to have a grapple with both regulating AI and having it... Uh, using it and, and, and the national growth strategy. It's also a country, we just reported the numbers earlier this month, that is set for negative 0.2% growth. Um, so I'm curious, when you're talking to companies and looking at negative 0.2% growth in Germany, you know, how are you convincing them that it's worthwhile to, to invest in robotics? The solution we offer is a very clear, commercially ROI-driven solution, right? So it's not a nice-to-have vitamin type of solution. It really is a solution that taps right into the center of what those companies do, and that is manufacturing. The classical, as you mentioned, mid-cap manufacturing company, about 80% of those processes are actual manufacturing processes, right, besides back office functions, purchasing, and so on. And so um, we see shortage of labor, 
being the biggest driver by far. I think it's one of the most pressing issues, pressing issues of our time. The second is we've seen, not only in COVID, but also afterwards, just disrupted supply chains, right? But that doesn't stop us from you know, requiring those products. And so what happens is manufacturing is happening much more locally again. And then the third aspect that drives this is cost, cost pressure, especially in the current economic times, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, Mark. And so I think there's a storm brewing up that's only accelerating over the next years. And so I think the future, if we're not acting now on automation, on precise automation with a clear ROI, deployed to a robust level with a high uptime, uh, is actually pretty, pretty dramatic, potentially. And so we actually want to you know, want to change that. We want the future to be prosperous, to be at you know, three, four, five, six percent growth, and not minus uh, zero point two. And so we think in manufacturing, which ultimately, especially in Germany, is is still at the core of our economy in the Mittelstand. Um, there's a huge demand for automation, and uh, we want to drive yeah. and push that into. The what about the larger companies? And I know that it sounds like you've got a partnership with with one of Germany's kind of industrial giants. Yeah, so uh, we just uh, actually today announced our partnership with Telecom, $120 billion company. Uh, we had Tim Hertges, the CEO, come by our Munich-based Robco uh, factory. We have a robot factory in the heart of Munich uh, to seal um, that deal. And we'll um, especially go after bigger clients, such as you know, the BMWs and Vivo, uh, VWs and chefs of this world. And we'll tap into both the trust that a brand like Telecom generates, but then we also offer a solution that consists of our software and hardware stack, right. but also taps into telecoms connectivity and cloud connectivity. And so they're basically they're providing the connectivity for like you going out and, and working with customers like in, in automotive. So yeah, so maybe one number that we find really impressive, um, which is 70% of our customers are first time robot automation users, right? So we've been hearing and reading about automation for the past decades, right. but the actual number is 70%. So for the bigger companies, that doesn't hold true, right? right. They have tried out automation yeah, in the yeah. past. They you know, have the means to, to spend on automation. Um, but you still look at a challenge that is very much not a standalone robot arm, but it's a fully connected system, right? And so Telecom helps tremendously in tapping into connectivity into MES, manufacturing execution systems, what, what, ERP so systems, to make that happen. Oh, it's, there's too many acronyms at me. Well, <laughs> what's that video, sir? So it's manufacturing execution system. So think, of, right, right. think of that hearing aid again that we talked about. Um, you, you, know, you see different components come together, microphone, plastics component, and so on. And you basically have a manufacturing execution system orchestrating those assembly and manufacturing tasks yeah. from the raw materials coming into the factory, then manufacturing automated way by us at Robco, and then going out again as finished products. And that happens in this manufacturing execution system, which we have to tap into to truly have one holistic offering in place. May yeah. I double click on the Germany point? Because yeah, I actually please. think it's really important, and it was yeah. part of our thesis. Two things. Um, I didn't fully appreciate the extent of labor shortage issues, well, in Western Europe, the US, and particularly in Germany as well. You know, Robco's customers are thinking about ROI, that's important, but it's even more than that. They cannot find people to work on factory floors any longer because younger generations prefer to work on Uber or Deliveroo or some of these on-demand platforms as opposed to doing very repetitive manual tasks over and over again on a factory floor. So for them, it's yes, ROI, of course, is really important, but it's also just not being able to find the, the people to do these jobs. So that's number one. And then number two, we actually had a thesis on why the next very large global robotics company will start in Germany, and it's twofold. You know, uh, think about uh, the, the university with, where uh, Roman studied, TUM. It's the best engineering university in Germany, one of the best in Europe. If a team graduates from Stanford, they're going to look at customers near them and think, what do these technology companies need? How can I help them? There is a reason why, you know, when graduating in Munich out of TUM, you look at the customers around you and you think, how can I help them help the economy? Because, of course, the Mittelstand, as you said, is the base of the German economy. Yeah. So I think there is a reason why, you know, some of the smartest founders in Germany go after the manufacturing problem, first of all. And second of all, you know, I'm a proud European. We invest globally at Sequoia, but I'm a proud European. And I think there is a reason why Germany has some of the best talent, because some of the best robotics and AI universities are in Germany and Switzerland. So TUM is an excellent one. There is ETH in Zurich. And a lot of this talent from ETH actually moves to Munich for, you know, startup to be clear, opportunities. You mean, like, sorry, the next, 
the next global global company. You imagine yeah. like a global robotics I coming. I imagine out. Robco to be a global robotics sure. company in the next few years. Yeah. Absolutely. So actually, being born out of Germany was part of our thesis, despite yeah. the slowdown in in economic growth. Roman, how much of your business is in Germany right now? Can you share that? About 80% is what we can share, um, but it's it's been 100%, you know, up to yeah. okay. uh, the first half of last year. Yeah, yeah. So um, there was another there's another slide that I think was really interesting about our conversation in Europe. I don't know if I can pull it up, um, but it's sort of predictable about looking at the global venture funding landscape, right? And we have uh, hopefully it shows up. There it is. Um, uh, we have my home country uh, taking the lion's share there, uh, and I can't. My vision is kind of crappy, but. Is it four, four, four billion in, in Europe? What, what's the, we should make the, make the bull case for, for Europe right there. When you look at that graph and you look at some of the funding, and I think that that's this, the stats in Europe are still kind of lagging behind last year, right? We've all heard the story before about aside from Spotify, ASML, there's not a big global European hit. What, what's, what's your bull case? There is no question that building out of Europe is harder. We talk about this quite often, right? But there is also no question that I meet founders on a daily basis that are certainly going to be able to do it. I just think the talent in Europe is absolutely incredible. And there are teams like Roman at Robco and many other founders in our portfolio that we really think will start or are starting in Europe and will build global businesses, first of all. Second of all, going back to my, my point on engineering talent, I really think Europe is um, in a great place from that perspective. We have some of the best AI researchers we have some of the best robotics people. We have really great engineering universities. It's in Germany, but it's across the continent. Um, so I am a big believer in, in Europe, for sure. But it is also certainly harder. And, yeah. and founders, I think, realize that along the way. But probably that's even more of a challenge and even more exciting, I hope. It's also harder to raise growth capital here, which seems to be a, a major. Is that, do, you, do you think that's the case? Like, are, you, are you seeing fewer growth deals? Like, where is Sequoia on growth in Europe right now? I've been in venture capital, I'll just say, for over a decade, for a long time. Um, I don't think today access to capital is the issue. Mm, what is the issue? I think the issue is um, that it's harder to build country by country, first of all. You start in Germany, and then you have to think about the next country, you have to think about the US. Many businesses that want to build, build um, billions and billions in revenue and want to be the global category leader have to think about the US. Yeah. And expanding from Europe to the US, of course, is no easy feat. Many companies have done it. I have no doubt that Robco will do it. But it's certainly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to make it sound trivial. Right. So I think it's building country by country. It's some of the regulations yeah. around employment in particular that makes it more difficult. Um, but again, I think the infrastructure for me is the talent, and the talent is there, and the quality of founders, the best founders in Europe are as good as the best founders in the US, and they're as ambitious as the most ambitious founders in the US. And, and I really want to emphasize this because I think there is a misconception about the level of ambition in Europe. I think you know, the, the outlier founders we partner with certainly have the same vision and, and want to build very large businesses. Yeah. Uh, many of them leave for the States in part because there's the, the draw of the valley and then if they ever want to go public. Yes. Right. Uh, Roman, I'll, I'll spare you the IPO question because you're probably <laughs> too early stage, but are you committed to staying in, in Munich? Like, do you see that as, are you, are you based there forever or what's? We want to build the category leading company for the Western world, so Europe and the US. Yeah. So at some point in time, we'll open up uh, at least uh, one U.S. office. Um, we have several U.S. team members already, but based in Munich, based in Europe. And so for us, it's more of a timing question yeah. than a if question. I'll do a quick one since we have running out of time. But have you, done any, you haven't done anything in defense right now. It's something where a lot of attention around in, in Europe, obviously, and around robotics. Is that potential for you? There's, there's quite some potential. Um, nothing we can share just yet, uh, okay. but uh, we are not, we're not, you know, we don't hold still um, from that area. You know, Robco is a hardware company that's growing like a software company, which is really no easy feat. And at scale, in order to keep that level of ambition, I think the US is, is definitely an important geography. Yeah, 100%. Can I turn to you? What about, is, is Sequoia thinking about more defense and more defense in Europe? Absolutely. Um, you know, as a citizen, I really hope that our governments are going to invest more in defense. Okay. Unfortunately, especially in Europe, we've been under-investing since the end of the Cold War. And um, there's nothing like unfortunately were on your doorstep to really wake you up. So as a citizen, I certainly hope that governments will, will invest even more in defense across Europe. Great. I hope you can all read about both of those things in Bloomberg. So thank you so much. I'm sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> thank really you for having us, Mark. Thank, thank you, you, Roman. Okay.